Thank you. So the question we want to um, introduce here for this rapid fire piece, and I'll put it first um, to Carol and Kelly and um, Tamara and Janet, and then open it up, is just um, in, in a nutshell then, what is it we need to address in institutional settings of care and services for people with later and advanced dementia over the next decade? Uh, I think it's such a big um, challenge that for me, the, the key issue is recognizing that this is a population of individuals that whose lives we need have been lived and that they have as much value as those individuals whose lives have yet to be lived. I, I think our core problem is a value problem. They're old, uh, they have dementia, they don't vote anymore, um, their resources are, if they still exist, are dispersed differently. Um, and so they're a, a, a voiceless group um, with extreme vulnerability that it's easy, without any ill intent or mal intent, um, to forget about. Um, and the single group that doesn't forget them, of course, are the families that go through that ordeal with them, if, assuming the family stays with them. So for me, it's a it's an issue of values, um, which goes to the core of reallocating resources. We have to reallocate resources if we want to change some of these things. There probably are enough resources in the system, but we'll have to choose to spend some of them here. And I think we've not had those discussions and made those choices in a very deliberate way and said we can change this. Um, going back to Howard's comment earlier, we tend to say, um, we tend to talk about the barriers why it's difficult to change. We actually have known how to manage pain properly for at least three decades, probably five. Um, we don't have to not manage pain well. What we have to do is look at what are the system issues that are causing us not to manage the pain level. It's not individuals. It's not that the care providers don't care. Um, it, I think we've got system level issues and we're looking at it with a really naive lens um, uh, that focuses on individual residents or individual care providers. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. Um, I think I think some of the promising solutions are, are kind of different um, for acute care and residential care. But I guess the one thing that I would say um, is that we 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 did a survey, a provincial, a province-wide survey, about a year and a half ago, and we asked healthcare providers. Um, uh, things around a palliative approach and and we find first of all that uh, providers um, have some difficulty in identifying when people are on a palliative track and in the context of residential care I find this kind of interesting because in our province the average length of stay in residential care is 15 months obviously some people stay longer some people stay shorter but the average length of stay is 15 months so a lot of residential care facilities are in fact um, de facto hospices and so I, I, I um, you know, when we asked in our survey about identification of people who were dying, people, uh, providers would say to us, oh yeah, you know, well, we're, ha we're having trouble identifying people who are dying, and, and plus, um, they don't actually see the benefits of actually applying principles of palliative care to these populations. So I'm not really sure um, what's going on with people, but I think some of it has to do with, we have, both in acute care and residential care settings, we have orientations um, that we, orientations to care that are not looking at dying as an orientation. And in, in my mind, um, you know, when providers say to us in our studies, you know, th these folks don't belong here, and I ask them, well, where do they belong? They, they don't know where they belong, but they don't belong here, and it has a lot to do with, this actually isn't a population of people that I want to care for. This is not what I got into, you know, being, uh, being, working in acute care, and I don't want to care for dying patients. But in fact, that's where they are, and that's who's in front of us. And uh, until we get our head around that, um, I think we're not going to move very far in terms of enhancing the quality of care and the quality of life for people with dementia. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, two very similar but different takes on the same answer, I think. Do you, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, 
So I, I think an important point is that these are places where people die, but importantly, they're also places where people live. And sometimes they're living as long as two and three years. They're also places where people work and places where people visit. So we need to make sure that um, we understand that when we're thinking about long-term residential care. And I think if we value it, it means enabling those who are at the front lines to actually have the time to be able to care. Because in my domestic or Canadian studies, when comparing with international studies, one of the big challenges that I see is that we don't give our care providers enough time to be able to provide the care that they want to do, that they've been trained to do, and that they need to do. And that component of relationship is, uh, or the idea of relationship is fundamentally important because most of the people that have gone into this work have done so because they want to build relationships with el uh, elderly people and older adults. But if they're not given the time to do that, what's going to make them stay in this in, in this work? And we see frequently that there's a lot of burnout and a, a lot of problems uh, for the workers that are, are doing the care work. Thanks, Tamara. Janet, anything to add? Just make a couple of couple of additional points. And one is that the vast, the, the a very small minority of older people will end up in long-term care, uh, residential long-term care. But the vast majority of those who do have end-stage dementia. Um, so it is important that we get a handle on this for, within any kind of dementia care strategy um, because that's really the, um, the majority of the population in, in long-term residential care settings. Um, but at the same time, and following on uh, Tamara's point, um, one, of the, one of the points that Carol made is that um, a small proportion of the um, residential care um, residents are what she called orphaned. Most of them have family members who have been um, deeply involved in their care up until, until that point and remain deeply involved in their care after admission to long-term care. They're not abandoning their family members to long-term care. Um, they are continuing to um, contribute to the care of that person and monitoring the quality of the care that they get from the professional caregivers. And so it, it's important to understand the role of the family caregiver even within residential long-term care. Thank you. Um, questions? Randy, we have person with the white shirt and tie was the first one. <laughs> the hardest for you to get to. It's a maze. I'm Chris Frank. I'm with the uh, representing College of Family Physicians. When I speak to family physicians who work in long-term care, one of the overriding concerns in addition to the sort of institutional and sort of medicine aspect of, of some of the challenges you've described are the expectations of families. And I think that that is still something that needs a lot of work from a policy and sort of, for want of a better term, marketing point of view. I mean, you see people who are clearly pallied from everybody's perspective where, you know, families are very challenged in a, with an incapable patient of entering into that discussion of, you know, setting, setting goals of care that I think would necessarily match the persons if they were given the opportunity. And there's a lot of pressure on staff. I mean, even with that situation there, sounds like it was the opposite of what people wanted, but you often see people being sent to hospital in a situation where nobody wants to send them except for, you know, cer certain family members. And I think that's a, I'm not sure if it's a policy issue, but certainly a societal issue. I think it's a, a policy issue. Um, it's really clear that a good residential care is predicated on there having been a robust primary care uh, model in place, and and the discussions have been started early, and expectations have begun to get managed early. If it's then possible, and it certainly isn't in every facility in this country, for the primary care physician to then care continue to care for the individual, that makes it even better. That's often not the case in my experience. I agree. I think primary care is critical. Who has the microphone? Somebody, okay, please. <laughs> I'm a physician. I'm actually a diabetologist, and uh, I work in a hosp university hospital, and not in the palliative care, but I often see uh, these patients uh, in the ward, and uh, what strikes me is the amount of care 
that is completely futile that we uh, administer. One example is the finger pricking of uh, the chemist strips and the, 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 the blood glucose measurements on which we base no decision at all. And these people are often pricked four times a day in difficult conditions, costs a lot of money. Uh, a few years back, the American Diabetes Association made an evaluation of the cost of care in a uh, home care setting. Uh, about half of the daily costs actually are uh, spent on this type of diabetes care, which is in most cases futile at that at that time. So one finger prink uh, once in a while, uh, plus monitoring of the symptoms of diabetes would probably be sufficient in most cases. So it's it just a, uh, an example of research uh, resource allocation uh, that you were talking about that uh, uh, is actually kind of our fault because we fail to change our mind setting at different stages of the game for the patient and we fail to see what's important for the patient and we stick with our rules that we tend to tend to apply to younger individuals more lt individuals so i think it's a it's something that is important at the system level but it's also important at the training level it's also important at the individual professional level to reflect on that and try to change the standard of care uh, throughout our institutions. Um, uh, Thank you. Drug therapy in long-term care is a good, another good example of that. We have a variable in our database on nine or more medications, but we don't use it much because there's no variability because so many people are on more than nine medications, and actually many of them are on 15 or more medications uh, without any real thought about what that means or the consequences of it or, the, or what is the goal here of having individuals on all these medications. Um, we also have in Canada a unacceptably high rate of antipsychotic administration without uh, appropriate diagnosis, even though lots of jurisdictions in the country are working hard on it. Our most successful jurisdictions still have rates higher than countries that have made more advances. So that's not just an expense. That actually causes, as we heard earlier, a harm to individuals. So there's, there are a lot of examples of, of do, well, you have many too, of doing, th why are we doing CPR in the last 30 days of life? You know, it's not clear, and, and we still find lots of instances of that. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it goes to our ability to shift our orientations of care as people transition. And, uh, you know, it's not that um, we would want to advocate for not doing anything t to people. Um, but um, we, we don't tend to have those conversations early with people. So, you know, when people are in earlier stages of dementia or in um, mild cognitive impairment where they may still be able to have some discussions about what, what they would want, those discussions should be happening way, way upstream with, with patients themselves and with their families so that we're preventing the things that seem to be happening to people down the road. Um, and, um, you know, I have so many people that have said to me, well, you know, we can't talk about these things because we're in a death-denying society. I, I actually think that families want to talk about these things. Um, I actually think that healthcare providers are really uncomfortable. <laughs> and we've seen that in studies um, that we've been involved with around advanced care planning, where families are talking to everybody else except their physician. Um, or their health care provider. So we have time for one more question in this round, and then we'll have the other two presentations and more questions. So, so I want to pick up, Carol, on your comment about there's probably enough money in the system, and ask the question, why aren't we actually thinking about interventions that would lead to the redistribution that might need to take place? Because presumably where the money is is in the acute care hospital where we're spending tons on, on trying to keep somebody alive who's trying to die and not putting it in the place where people are trying to die peacefully and, and care. So 
Could we think about interventions that, that actually demonstrate that if you redistribute it, like can we somehow enable long-term care facilities to get that money, you know, you know, sort of uh, fee for service, we'll take that dying person off your hands and you give us half the resources. You know, I, I know it sounds silly, but until we do that, do something like that, I don't know how we're going to get the redistribution because as Dr. Banerjee said, you know, people are across uh, institutions institutional lines, and we don't have ways of doing that redistribution because they're different pockets of money. I, I think we do need to think differently, and I don't know quite how we do that, but our interventions as health professionals have been, um, they're innovative and they're interesting and they're exciting, but they tend to be quite homogeneous. There really isn't a lot of, I would submit, innovation in this area in terms of how do we get out of the box and look at this really differently and shake it up and look radically. We're, even our most innovative, cutting edge things tend to be cook, not cookie cutter, but they're in the same family of things that we've been trained in. Uh, whether you're in biomedical basic research or whether you're in health services research, um, you, I think we've got to do things that enable us and encourage us and force us to be more innovative about how we, in this case, do things like think about redistribution. How would we catalyze redistribution? How would we change that conversation? How would we demonstrate? And it isn't just about saving money. I think that's the other mistake we make in the system. The value discussion is what kind of a life do we want for older adults in our society with dementia as they die? And do Canadians want 50% of them to die in, in fairly extreme levels of pain. And, and we're not having that conversation because um, it, it goes with the financial one. We, we have to do them together. 